I designed the HVAC for my house, and now it was time to put it in. Once all my materials arrived, the first task was to build the boots and boot frames, and then later hang them up in the rafters. If you notice, a lot of the boots had hard 90s on them, and that's because there were some space constraints, but also I did not want to turn flex into the boot. Uh, that causes a lot of restriction, and actually when you start turning flex, you add a lot of friction to the duct system. It's better to make that turn using a hard 90, so I did not mind the extra expense doing that because I knew I would get a performance benefit out of it. And for all you flex haters out there, yes, I am using flex, and that's because when you run flex straight with no bends, turns, or sags, it performs exactly as well as round pipe. My trunks were mostly made up of round snap lock, and I prefer snap lock to square or rectangular duct because it's easier to install it's less expensive, and it actually outperforms it aerodynamically. Round pipe is always better than any form of rectangular duct. Now, of course, I was very liberal in the use of duct mastic because I wanted to make sure my duct system did not leak. I even used duct mastic on flex duct connections. Even though tape and a mechanical fastener like a Panduit strap is acceptable, I prefer duct mastic because once it dries, it is a perfect seal. So you may be wondering, why am I even bothering to insulate my ducts and seal my ducts if they're gonna be in the conditioned attic? And that's a really good question. There are some really smart people out there that uh, maintain that you don't need to seal your ducts in an encapsulated attic. In fact, you want them to leak so that you can move around some conditioned air in your attic. And it's not that I don't agree with that, but the problem with not sealing your ducts is you don't get to control how much leakage you have. Who's to say that there wouldn't be an imbalance between return air leakage and supply air leakage that could create some pressure imbalances in the house, and that's what I don't want. So I'm gonna go ahead and seal all my ducts, and I have another plan for being able to deliver some conditioned air into the attic. Now, what about insulation? Well, you've got to insulate your supply ducts to a minimum level to prevent condensation. Because let's say the dehumidifier stops doing its job and the humidity in the attic spikes. If I don't have any insulation on my supply ducts, they're all gonna start sweating and that's not acceptable. Neither is that compliant with code. Code says that even in a conditioned space, you need to insulate your ducts to avoid condensation. Now the return ducts don't really need to be insulated because they're not gonna get cold enough to create condensation and there's no temperature difference uh, between the inside of that return duct and the air outside of the return duct because again, the attic is an encapsulated condition space or at least a semi-conditioned space depending on who you talk to. Uh, so it's not necessary to insulate the return ducts but I'm gonna go ahead and do it anyway. It's not that much more work and yes, it's a little bit redundant but that's okay. All right, we're gonna break a few other bad habits or maybe not bad habits but unnecessary habits, maybe outdated thinking with this project. So it is totally okay to deliver air from the interior of the room and blow it towards the perimeter. That is fine as long as you properly design the air terminals and that's where Akamangle T comes in. So some of the old school thinking is you gotta put your registers along the uh, walls because you wanna wash the wall with air and that is the case in older houses that are not well insulated, single pane glass. You don't want that glass to frost up or condensate so you blow some air on it to raise it above the dew point temperature that's not the case with modern houses especially high performance houses that are well insulated and well sealed so if you notice and it's kind of hard to tell but you can see two supply boots on this side of our living room now this is a, a vaulted ceiling or a cathedral ceiling it's 14 feet high at the peak if you notice there's none on the other side and that's because the way the roof is shaped, I would ha have had to run those ducts on the outside in the unconditioned part of the uh, attic above the spray farm roof deck. And I didn't want to do that. So I went ahead and just ran my ducts, of course, on this side because this is where the air handler is. And I just put some supply registers on this side of the living room. Well, you may say, well, how are you going to get air over here? Will it not get hot on this side of your house? Well, a couple things are in my favor. Uh, these are sort of north and north 
east facing walls so they're not going to get a lot of direct sun in the heat of the day the other thing is i'm going to invest in really good supply registers that i have done some research on i made sure that my velocity is right and that the size is right and that the throw is right so that that air can take advantage of the coanda effect it's going to get to the peak of the ceiling and then it'll diffuse down and the ceiling fan is going to be part of my strategy so in the summer it's going to be churning the air and getting that conditioned air down in the winter we're still going to run the ceiling fan but not as high because again you don't want it to feel drafty uh, but really there wasn't a lot of good ways to get air uh, without running your ducts in unconditioned space and that was just not going to happen so sometimes you're in that situation you don't always have to deliver air to the perimeter of the entire building. Now, sometimes it makes sense to deliver air to the perimeter or to deliver it above a window, especially with floor registers. You know, you're probably not gonna park a lot of furniture in front of a window, but don't be tied to that from a performance standpoint. You don't have to do that with modern houses. I'm gonna be putting in a four inch duct for a bath fan. So for years, I probably did hundreds of houses like this as a contractor. We would just dump flex out of that soffit and then we would connect it down into a, a terminal at the, at the soffit. Uh, but when you think about it, what are we asking that flex to do? We're asking it to be in the elements. Uh, in fact, even in the, in the line of sight of critters that may want to get in there and poke holes in it. Flex is not designed to be exposed to the elements, but I've done it. A lot of contractors down here do it. We just dump flex over the soffit. Well, I'm not going to do that with my house. It's amazing when you do your own house, you come up with things that you're not comfortable doing and you're like well if I'm not comfortable doing that for my house I probably should not be comfortable doing it for somebody else so from here on out when I do duct and exhaust fan I'm gonna run hard pipe out to the soffit uh, and then we can flex over to the fan which has not been installed yet and so that hard pipe is gonna go through there and that's a nice solid surface that they can spray foam against right there in the soffit I'll block around it and also, they'll be able to spray foam all around that to, to get the R value out of it. Uh, obviously, that pipe is going to take up space in that cavity. They may have to build up some spray foam around it, but that's really the only choice we have. There are very little gables that we can punch out of this house. Everything is going to be out of the, out of the soffit. And so eventually, we'll hook up the fan. The fan's going to be a really high efficiency one, and uh, more about that later. Also part of the roof-in stage was installing other elements like the refrigerant line set. Now when I did that, I had to make sure that I kept the line set protected and clean. I wanted to run it straight and have it look good, even though it would be hidden from view. And of course needed to protect it from damage from other disciplines during the build process. Later on, I returned to install my air handler, but that came with a lot of planning also. I mocked it up on SketchUp because the install area would be pretty tight, and I wanted to make sure everything would fit. I also did that so that I could get accurate plenum measurements to my sheet metal shop. I had a lot of fun installing my heat pump condenser. As you can see, it was being installed on sand, but I wanted to take it a little step further just to avoid any erosion problems. So I cut some 4x4s, I laid some pea gravel down, and then finally set my concrete foam pad to make a really nice looking level surface for the condenser to sit on. Next, it was time to make some more bends, so I slid my condenser out of the way and marked where I needed my piping to end up with some blue tape. That way I had plenty of room to work around, not having the unit my way. And I used my Hillmore benders with the reverse die so that I could easily make those bends. On my air handler, I had to flip my coil because I would be installing it as a horizontal left configuration. Everybody does it a little bit different, uh, but I like to go ahead and just hook up my liquid line as if I were not putting in a dryer, but leave space for the dryer. And then I just pick a spot and I cut it out. Uh, you can also run this liquid line up here really close to the uh, suction line and then dog leg out and then back in. That's another way to do it. Just a little short run right here. It just seemed like more trouble than it was worth. And then I did a pressure test on all my field joints and the evaporator coil and it held at well over 350 PSI. A few minutes have passed by and we're down to 268 microns, which is great. Uh, I also want to draw attention to the fact that our micron gauge is on the opposite end of the piping system than where we're actually pulling the vacuum from. So this micron gauge is reading all through the line sets, through the air handler coil, and back here. So that's really the ideal location. That way you're getting the worst case scenario microns, which in this case, worst case scenarios, 
pretty good. Okay, so we have passed our decay test. While I was waiting, I went ahead and got my Sourman manifolds and getting ready to break the vacuum. But the next thing we're gonna do, this valve is closed. Obviously, we are holding our vacuum just fine. Now it's time to put that Schrader valve back in. Once the Schrader valve is put back in, I broke my vacuum with the field charge, which was about six ounces of R410A. Now that everything was installed, we were ready for final inspection. And I was really happy with how it turned out. Of course, the next step will be startup and commissioning of the entire system, but that will be a video for another time. Thanks for watching.